Good evening, everyone. Welcome to, the, to Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government. My name is David Elwood. I'm the dean here. And welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. Uh, this night, when we do the Teddy White Lecture and the David Nyan Prize for Political Journalism is always a special night, but somehow this one feels the most special I can remember because we're here to celebrate some genuine American heroes at a time when there is much change and much drama uh, afoot in the world. Uh, I just want to say a couple of things here uh, by way of introduction. The first is that we're joined by another American hero, Walter Shorenstein, who's here with us tonight. You have no idea how important one single person can be in a country if you haven't listened and understood all the different things that Walter Shorenstein has done in his life. Uh, he has been involved in so many different things and in so many different ways. One vital part of that is the Shorenstein Center, which he has been so central in everything that we've done, and it's why we are here in part tonight. Also with us today are David White, the son of uh, Terry H. White. So uh, David, are you here some? Please stand up. There he is. And your wife, Margaret, is with you as well, right? Great. Thank you. Um, it's a great honor to have you here, and it's also, this is a, a spectacular moment to celebrate the enormous contributions of your father and your father-in-law. I will leave Alex Jones to talk more about those, but uh, this is the 19th annual Theodore H. White Lecture on Press and the Politics. Um, we also are here, um, Teddy White, I'll say just two things about Teddy White. One of them is that he served on the Harvard Kennedy School Visiting Committee, uh, and he was actually one of the early architects of what has become this remarkable place known as the Shorenstein Center. And of course, we're joined by the Honorable John Lewis, um, someone who has seen a great deal in history uh, and has created a great deal of history and whose remarks will undoubtedly inspire us yet again. So I want to just simply now turn it over to Alex Jones. Um, oh, I should also, of course, I don't want to forget, we're also here to honor Bob Herbert, uh, who is here with us today. <laughs> As virtually everyone in this room will know, he's an op-ed columnist uh, for the New York Times, and he's going to be the recipient of the David Nyan Prize for Political Journalism. So it's obviously been an extraordinary campaign, and it's, uh, I think, one of those rare moments when we stare at one hand at a time when the problems of the world threaten to overwhelm us in ways that I can't remember. Uh, I've been to New York three times in the last three weeks, and each week is worse than the last. <laughs> Um, and on the other hand, you, it is a moment when the excitement and the energy, the in inspiration of young people has never been greater. So we're very, very fortunate today to have um, such a remarkable man to talk to us about this. I want to say a couple words about Alex Jones. Uh, he's the uh, Lawrence M. Lombard Lecturer in Press and Public Policy. He's the director of the Jones Jorenstein Center for the Press, Politics, and Public Policy. He covered the press for the New York Times between 1983 and 92, and uh, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in 1987. In 1991, he co-authored with his wife, Susan Tift, who is also here with us. We're very, very happy to have you here, Susan. Um, the Patriarch, uh, The Rise and Fall of the Bingham Dynasty. And indeed, um, in 1992, he left the Times to work on the trust, um, the private and powerful family behind the New York Times, again co-authored with Susan Tift, which was a finalist for the National Book Circle, uh, National Book Critics uh, Circle Award. He's been a Neiman Fellow. He's been a host on National Public Radio's On the Media, uh, a host of an, an executive editor of PBS Media Matters. He's done a great many remarkable things in his life, but for us, the remarkable thing he does is number one head the Joan Shorenstein Center, and number two, introduce tonight's speakers. Thank you very much. Oh, 
Thank you, David. This is indeed a, uh, a great night for the Shorenstein Center. It's one we always look forward to, and as David said, and I couldn't agree more, this one is extra, extra special. As some of you already know, the Shorenstein Center was founded in 1986 as a memorial to Joan Shorenstein, a truly remarkable journalist who died of breast cancer after a distinguished career with CBS. Her father, Walter Shorenstein, who you have heard praise tonight, and we'll hear of praise a little bit more now, endowed the center as a place for a focused and searching examination of the intersection of press politics and public policy. He did it as a memorial to Joan. He not only made the center possible, but he has remained vitally interested in what we do and has been our unstinting supporter and friend. He's here tonight with Joan's sister, Carol. And I ask that you join me in recognizing one more time this remarkable Shorenstein family. Thank you. A bit later, you will hear from our Theodore White lecturer for 2008, the Honorable John Lewis. But I first have another task to perform, which is an honor, but a bittersweet one. In 2005, we at the Shorenstein Center lost a great and much admired friend, David Nyan, when he, when he died unexpectedly. Some of you did not know David, and I want to speak of him briefly as we this year bestow the fourth annual David Nyan Prize for Political Journalism. David Nyan was a man of many parts, a devoted family man, beloved friend, and always a boon companion. He was a real Boston guy, a big handsome man with a killer smile, Irish eyes and the rare power to walk into a room and make the lights seem to come on. I saw him do it again and again during his time as a fellow at the Shorenstein Center. But tonight we honor David Nyan, the consummate reporter and political journalist, which is the role that occupied much of his life and at which he could not be bested. David was a reporter and then a columnist at the Boston Globe, and his work had both a theme and a character. The theme was almost always power, political power, and also especially the abuse of political power by the big shots at the expense of the little guys. He loved politics. He also loved politicians. As a group, he respected them. He felt they were often given a raw deal and judged by a standard that was smug and sanctimonious, two things David never was. But if politics was the theme of David's work, the character of that work was a mixture of courage and righteous anger, leavened by a great sense of humor and the ability to write with grace and passion. He relished a fight with a political figure or perspective, yet had a knack of seeing beyond the surface of issues and the baloney at the heart of things, and especially to the reality of what was going on. He was a self-avowed liberal and not defensive about it. As a columnist at the Globe, he was a battler, a no-holds-barred advocate, but he was always also surprising his readers with his take on things because most of all, David Nyan was his own man and he called them as he saw them. Were he here, he would still be in a state of delirious joy that Barack Obama has been elected President of the United States. In his memory and honor, the Nyan family <laughs> In his memory and honor, the Nyan family and many friends and admirers of David Nyan have endowed the David Nyan Prize for Political Journalism to recognize the kind of gutsy, stylish, and relentless journalism that David Nyan embodied. David's wife, Olivia, his children, many members of his family are here tonight, and I would like to ask them all to please stand. Olivia and I and told me just before we began uh, that David's papers, his notebooks, his interviews, uh, videos, tapes, whatever, 
uh, have now been installed at the Howard Gottlieb Archival Research Center at Boston University, where David Halberstam's, Frankie Fitzgerald's papers are as well. In other words, he is in very good company. This year, the David Nyan Prize for Political Journalism goes to Bob Herbert of the New York Times. <laughs> That was Mrs. Bob Herbert. <laughs> the thing about Bob Herbert that David Nyam would have liked best was his absolute determination to represent the interests of the powerless. And David would have loved Bob Herbert's anger when the little guy is getting a raw deal. This is Bob Herbert in his column on the op-ed page of the New York Times. The most important thing the Democrats and President-elect Obama can do with regard to the economy is bring back a sense of fairness and equity. The fat cats who place the entire economy at risk with their greed and manic irresponsibility are trying to lay claim to every last dime in the national treasury. Meanwhile, we're nowhere close to an economic recovery program that will help the people who are hurting most. Or how about this from his election day column? Right now, the United States is a country in which wealth is funneled absurdly from the bottom to the top. The richest 1% of Americans now holds close to 40% of all the wealth in the nation and maintains an iron grip on the levers of government power. The US is also a country in which blissful ignorance is celebrated and intellectual excellence is not given short shrift it's ridiculed. That sounds a lot like David Nyan in high dudgeon to me. But even more like David Nyan is the other aspect of Bob Herbert's work, which is finding the person, the human being, whose story makes the point and then telling that story. One of my favorites was in his column just after Barack Obama had won the Democratic presidential nomination. It was an incredible moment and an historic moment, one in, in and of itself. Bob got at what it meant to African Americans and to all Americans by telling the story of P.T. Cochran, an 88-year-old citizen of Detroit. Many years earlier, Mr. Cochran had been a student at Wilberforce University, a black school in Ohio near the town of Xenia. He and a fellow student had gone into Xenia to see a movie. And when they tried to buy a ticket, they were turned away. The theater is closed, they were told, but of course it wasn't. So Mr. Cochran and his friend simply stood there to see if they would let anyone else in. As long as the two young black men stood there, the ticket taker wouldn't let anyone else in. They stood there for six hours. Then they called their school and told their friends what they were doing. And those friends alerted students at nearby Antioch College, which was essentially white. More than 100 students from both schools converged on the theater to back the two boys up. They stood there with us to back us up, Mr. Cochran remembered, his voice breaking. We stayed there until the theater closed that night. And then we came back the next day, which was Sunday, and stood there until 2 or 3 in the afternoon when they finally decided to let us in. Telling that story is how Bob Herbert explained what it meant for a national political party representing Americans of every ethnicity to nominate an African American for president, which is exactly the kind of journalism that the David Nyman Prize is intended to honor. Bob was born in Brooklyn, got his degree, degree in journalism from State University of New York, and began his career as a reporter at the Newark Star-Ledger. He was a reporter, editor, and columnist for the New York Daily News, and then a national correspondent for NBC News. In 1993, he joined the New York Times as an op-ed columnist, writing on politics, urban affairs, and social trends, but always with an eye out for the little guy. His writing has earned him many awards, including the Meyer Berger Award for coverage of New York City, and the American Society of Newspaper Editors Award for Distinguished Newspaper Writing. His work would have won David Nyan's respect, and that is a mark of great distinction. 
It is my honor to present this year's David Nyan Prize for Political Journalism to Bob Herbert. It is obviously a great honor, a tremendous honor, um, to receive this award, and I want to um, give a special thanks to the Shorenstein family here today, the Nyan family here today, Dean Elwood, Alex Jones, thank you so much, and um, everyone else who's a part of this, and everyone uh, for coming here um, this evening. If um, I begin to tear up during my remarks, it's because someone mentioned where the time stopped closed today. <laughs> so I may just break out weeping at any moment. Um, you know, it's especially gratifying to receive this award um, at the end of uh, such a fantastically exciting and historic uh, campaign season. And I remember a campaign year long ago, 1968, uh, which began with a tremendous amount of excitement and um, enthusiasm and optimism, especially among young people. And of course, we all know that that year was a year of great tragedy. It's the year we lost uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. It's the year we lost Bobby Kennedy. And at the Democratic Convention, there was rioting and chaos. And um, this, I think, is the most exciting year since 68 for presidential politics. And once again, young people especially were uh, fired up, exuberant, optimistic, and the campaign ended on what I think was um, such a wonderful note for so many reasons that you all understand. The, um, I have thought since election day of so many people who are no longer with us, who I wish could have seen what happened this year. One of the uh, people was Dr. Carolyn Goodman, who had become a pretty good friend of mine, and um, whose son, Andrew Goodman, was one of the three civil rights workers killed in Mississippi in 1964. And uh, I can't mention all the others, obviously, but two that I would like to mention were my parents. Chester and Adelaide Herbert from Montclair, New Jersey, um, who uh, ran upholstery shops there. And even at my advanced age, I still miss them every day. And I wish they could have seen what happened this election year and could have witnessed election night and seen Barack Obama become elected president. And I wish they could have been here tonight to see me win this fabulous award. So thank you very, very much. Theodore H. White was also a consummate reporter whose passion was politics. He came to Harvard on a newsboy scholarship and went on to a very distinguished career as a journalist and also a historian. Indeed, Teddy White, as he was universally known, changed both political journalism and politics when he wrote The Making of the President 1960 about the Kennedy-Nixon campaign. For the first time, he raised the curtain on the warts and all side of presidential campaigns and changed forever the level of candor about decision making in the human drama that is now at the heart of campaign coverage. He followed that first book with three more, Making of the President books in 64, 68, and 72. No doubt, the Making of the President 2008 will not be a book, but an industry. Yet no one has yet matched those smart and groundbreaking examinations of what happens and why 
in the maelstrom of a political campaign. And it is fair to say that Teddy White's heirs are the journalists of today who try to pierce the veil of politics, to understand what is happening, and then to analyze and deliver the goods to those of us who are trying to understand. Tonight we are joined by Teddy White's son, David, and David's wife, Margaret, as David Elwood introduced. Uh, I just wanted to say we are very glad that you're with us tonight on this very, this, this occasion that means so much to us. Before his death in 1986, Teddy White was one of the architects of what became the Shorenstein Center, one of the first moves of Marvin Kalb, the center's founding director, was to raise the funds and establish the Theodore H. White Lecture on the Press and Politics in Teddy White's honor. This year, the Theodore White Lecture is to be delivered by the Honorable John Lewis. Two months ago, the intense and historic presidential campaign we witnessed was electrified by the words of John Lewis. Representative Lewis had grown increasingly concerned by what he viewed as the dangerous race-baiting language used by the McCain-Palin campaign at their rallies. Bear in mind, John McCain and John Lewis are longtime friends. McCain has praised Lewis for something McCain himself has emblemized, courage in action. And so what John Lewis said had extra weight and special impact. He said that McCain and Palin were quote, sowing the seeds of hatred and division. What I'm seeing today, he said, reminds me too much of another destructive period in American history. George Wallace had not fired a gun, he said, but when he ran for president, he had created the climate and the conditions that encouraged vicious attacks against innocent Americans who were simply trying to exercise their constitutional rights. Senator McCain, and Governor Palin are playing with fire, he warned. And if they are not careful, that fire will consume us all. I was struck as I walked by one of our posters announcing tonight's Teddy White lecture that our speaker was identified as the Honorable John Lewis. And if ever there was a title that suited the man, that is it. He has embodied the concept of honor and courage for decades. And when he spoke those harsh words about John McCain, the effect was thunderous. John met Lewis had the moral authority to intervene at such a moment because of a lifetime of willingness to step into the center of racism and face it down. He grew up in segregation in Alabama, the son of sharecroppers, and became inspired by Martin Luther King's voice on the radio. In 1961, he was a freedom rider traveling across the South and putting his life on the line by simply sitting in white-only seats in buses. He was beaten and arrested and was not at all deterred. At the height of the Civil Rights Movement from 1963 to 1966, he was the young chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, and at 23 was considered one of the movement's most important figures, along with Dr. King. He was one of the architects and keynote speakers for the March on Washington and was particularly focused on registering African Americans to vote as he believed Dr. King was right that nonviolence was the way to change America. On Sunday, March 7, 1965, John Lewis led 600 peaceful protesters across the Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama on their way to Montgomery to demonstrate the need for voting rights. Alabama state troopers brutally attacked the marchers, and what became known as Bloody Sunday proved to be a pivotal moment in the civil rights movement because reporters were there to tell the story in pictures and words. By his count, and he should know, John Lewis has been physically attacked, seriously injured, and arrested a total of more than 40 times. In other words, he has walked the walk in the most powerful sense, and this has given power to his warning about the dangers he saw in the McCain campaign. Did his words have an effect? I think so. I think ultimately the presidential election turned out to be not about race for the vast majority of Americans. It turned out to be who was the best person for the job. And the result was the election of a black man to the presidency of the United States virtually without violence. 
As Congressman Lewis said on CNN following Barack Obama's election, our nation has witnessed a nonviolent revolution. That would not, could not, have happened without the persistence, the determination, and the guts of a small handful of people like John Lewis. He has served in Congress representing Atlanta for more than 20 years. He's the holder of more than 50 honorary degrees and received scores of awards. One that is of particular importance to us tonight is his distinction of being the only person to win the John F. Kennedy Profile in Courage Award for Lifetime Achievement. The point is that this coveted award is given for a single instance of great courage. John Lewis is the only person to ever receive it for a lifetime of courage. I am proud to present the 2008 Theodore White lecturer, the Honorable John Lewis. Thank you very much for those kind words of introduction. I'm delighted and very pleased to be here tonight to get out of Washington, just to get out and come to another part of the country. It's a little cold, but it's okay. <laughs> to see and honor three wonderful families that contribute so much to journalism. I've often said without the press, the civil rights movement would have been like a bird without wings. The American press has been a sympathetic referee in the struggle for social justice, for change. Now I realize tonight and I see the editor of my paper here, uh, Cynthia Tucker, from the Atlanta Constitution. And I probably should be very careful about anything I may say. <laughs> any and everything I said tonight, I believe is on the record, right? <laughs> I knew that I'm supposed to deliver a lecture. But I think what I have to say tonight will be more like a testimony. Bob, congratulations. I read you. I'm inspired by you. Keep it up. Keep writing. Keep using the pen. I want to be calm. I know I'm at an academic setting. And I want to be cool and steady and pick up some of those attributes of Barack Obama. <laughs> but I must tell you, it's going to be very hard. It's going to be very difficult. You know, Barack Obama was born in 1961, the year of the Freedom Ride. In 1961, I was 21 years old, had all my hair and a few pounds lighter. <laughs> as a nation and as a people, we have come a distance. And I must tell you that I'm so deeply touched to be invited to be here. For Teddy White, was a writer that I knew. I remember seeing him on the last and final campaign of Robert Kennedy 40 years ago. We were sitting in a hotel on the fifth floor, a 
of the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles in Bobby Kennedy's suite. When he told us, Robert Kennedy said, for us to remain there, that he was going downstairs to make his victory statement, and he will be returning, but he never returned. Teddy White was a gifted writer. I know he wrote a series of books called The Making of a President and about the election 1960 when a young, vibrant man named John F. Kennedy became president of the United States. If Teddy White was here today, tonight, to tell the story, he would enjoy writing about Senator Barack Obama's role to the presidency. What would he say? I think he would say that the struggle, the desire, the urge to create a more perfect union or to build what we in the civil rights movement call a beloved community did not start with this election and it will not end here today. From the very founding of the New England, of the founding of New England by a people who wanted to build a new world to free themselves from religious persecution. From the Boston Tea Party and the outcry against taxation without representation. From the Revolutionary War, the Declaration of Independence, and the creation of the United States of America as a republic, from the early days of slavery and the slave revolts, from the beginning of the abolitionist movement and the Underground Railroad, from the Dred Scott decision of the Supreme Court to the Civil War and the Reconstruction period, from the emergency of the Niagara Movement and the founding of the NACP from the Jim Crow period and the government sanction of legalized segregation and racial discrimination, from the Supreme Court decision of 1954 and the advent of the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955. For hundreds of years, there have been a people struggling and believing, pressing and praying, sacrificing and dying in hopes that they could bring this nation to this moment and beyond. After Rosa Parks decided to sit down on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama in December 1955, other people decided to stand up for justice all over our country. The protests and marches, sit-ins, boycotts were the beginning of a nonviolent movement a mass movement under the leadership of Martin Luther King, Jr. I have a dream. It was not this young man's first speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Five years earlier, the NACP celebrated the third anniversary of the Brown versus Board of Education decision with a prayer program for freedom on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Martin Luther King Jr., then a young minister, only 28 years old, who would become the voice of a mass movement in America that inspired people around the world, gave another speech that read like prophecy. He said, give us the ballot and we will fill our legislative hall with men of goodwill. Give us the ballot, and we will place judges on the benches of the South who will do justly and love mercy. Give us the ballot, and we will quietly and nonviolently, with our rancor or bitterness, implement the Supreme Court decision of May 17, 1954. Hundreds and thousands of young people primarily black college students were deeply inspired by Martin Luther King Jr. and they were inspired by the winds of change they saw blowing in Africa. Because of King's words and his example, they were inspired to answer a call that was ringing in their soul, a cry for justice, a cry for freedom, a cry for equal rights. 
In those days, in order to register to vote, many of our citizens had to pass a so-called literacy test, pay a poll tax, and recite certain sections of the Constitution. But in the spring of 1960, because of the inspiration of Martin Luther King Jr., we started sitting in, sitting down. And some said by sitting down, we were really standing up. In North Carolina, in Tennessee, in Georgia, in Alabama, in Mississippi, and all across the South, we saw these young, well-dressed college students sitting there in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion, waiting to be served. And the American press took those symbols and signs to the American people. These young people were attacked. Some had lighted cigarettes put out in their hair. Down their backs, people would spit on them. Some were just sitting there during their homework, working on a paper, reading a book. But they didn't give up. They didn't give in. They didn't become bitter. They didn't become hostile. Many were arrested and jailed. Just think a few short years ago, in Montgomery, Alabama, in Jackson, Mississippi, in other parts of the South, blacks and whites could not stay in the same hotel, ride in the same taxi cab. Yes, we saw those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. But it took a mass nonviolent movement to bring those signs down. Those signs inspired a president like John F. Kennedy. That movement, that protest, to make a speech in May of 1963, after America Evers had been assassinated in Mississippi. After hundreds and thousands of young people had been arrested and jailed in Birmingham, after Police Commissioner Bull Connor had used police dogs and fire hoses on young children and old women. I remember in June of 1963, a small group of us were invited to the White House to meet with President Kennedy. And it was in that meeting with Martin Luther King Jr., Roy Wilkins at NACP, Whitney Young of the National Urban League, James Farmer of Corps, and a wonderful leader, the Dean of Black Leadership at the time, A. Philip Randolph. When Mr. Randolph spoke up in that meeting with President Kennedy and said, Mr. President, the black monsters are restless and we're going to march on Washington. You can tell by the body language of President Kennedy, he didn't like what he heard. He said, Mr. Randolph, if you bring all these people to Washington, won't there be violence and chaos and disorder? And we would never get a civil rights bill through the Congress. Mr. Randolph responded and said, Mr. President, this will be an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent protest. We left that meeting with President Kennedy, came out on the lawn of the White House and announced to the media that we had a productive and meaningful meeting with the President of the United States. And we told him we were going to march on Washington. A few days later, on July 2nd, 1963, we met in downtown New York, in downtown Manhattan, at a local hotel, and invited four major white religious and labor leaders to join us in issuing the call for the march on Washington. I wish all those leaders were here today. I wish President Kennedy was here tonight. I wish Bobby Kennedy was here. I wish Lyndon Johnson could see what has happened in their America. I know many of you are so young. You are not even a dream. 
But we didn't get to the point that we are today simply because someone said, let's end segregation and racial discrimination. It was a struggle, an unbelievable struggle. After the march on Washington, August 28, 1963, when Dr. King stood and said, I have a dream today, a dream deeply rooted in American dream. There was so much hope, so much optimism. 18 days later, with the bombing of a little church in Birmingham, Alabama, where four little girls was killed on a Sunday morning. There was a sad and dark hour in the movement. But we didn't give up. We didn't give in. We didn't become bitter. We didn't become hostile. We kept the faith, and we kept our eyes on the prize. Many newspaper people, editors, wrote unbelievable articles. Politicians made statements and condemned the violence, the bombing in Birmingham, Alabama. And because of what happened in Birmingham, Alabama, on September the 15th, 1963, we made a decision, the movement did, that we will intensify our effort to gain the vote. When I spoke at the march on Washington on August 28, 1963, I've been reading a copy of the New York Times. And I saw a picture of a group of black women in Southern Africa, carrying signs saying, one man, one vote. So in my march on Washington speech, I said something like, one man, one vote is the African cry. It is ours too. It must be ours. And that became the rallying cry for the young people in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. We went to Selma in the heart of the Black Belt, majority like in Dallas County, where Selma is the county seat, about 50 miles south of Montgomery, only 2.1% of African Americans were registered to vote. You could only attempt to register to vote on the first and third Mondays of each month. You had to go down to the county courthouse, get a copy of the so-called literacy test, and attempt to pass this test. People stood in unmovable lines. A county called Lowndes County between Selma and Montgomery, the county was more than 80% African American, but there was not a single registered African American voter in the county. In the state of Mississippi, the state had a black voting age population of more than 450,000, but only about 16,000 blacks were registered to vote. A young man by the name of Bob Moses who attended Harvard. head of the uh, Mississippi Project, helped organize something called the Mississippi Summer Project. And we recruited more than 1,000 students, young people, lawyers, teachers, to come to Mississippi to work in freedom school, preparing people to pass the so-called literacy test. On the summer night of June 21st, 1964, three young men that I knew, Andy Goodman, Mika Schreiner from New York, white. James Shaney, African American from Mississippi. Went out to investigate the burning of an African American church. It was stopped by the sheriff, arrested, taken to jail. Later that same evening, they were taken from the jail, turned over to the Klan, where they were beaten, shot, and killed. And I said tonight, these three young men didn't die in the Middle East. They didn't die in Eastern Europe. They didn't die in Africa, or Central or South America. They died right here in our own country, trying to get all of our citizens to become participants in the democratic process. I wish they were still here. It was a sad and dark hour for the movement. President Lyndon Johnson, Olga J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI to open an office at the FBI in Mississippi. He 
called out part of the military to search for the bodies. And six weeks later, the bodies were discovered buried on a mound of dirt near Philadelphia, Mississippi. President Johnson on July 2nd, 1964, signed the Civil Rights Act. He won a landslide election in November 1964. Martin Luther King Jr. received the Nobel Peace Prize. He come back to America, hold a meeting at the White House with President Johnson and said, Mr. President, we need a strong voting rights act. President Johnson tell Dr. King in so many words, we don't have the votes in the Congress to get a voting rights act. I just signed the Civil Rights Act. Martin Luther King Jr. come back to Atlanta, meet with a group of us, and made a decision to join us in Selma, Alabama. And he said, we were right that act. In Selma, Alabama, you had a sheriff who guarded the courthouse like it was his own home. He wore a gun on one side, a nightstick on the other side. He carried an electric cap product in his hand, and he didn't use it on cows. He wore a button on his left lapel that said, never. And I remember when it was my day to lead a group of elderly black men and women to the courthouse, January the 18th, 1965. We get to the top of the steps, trying to go through a set of double doors, trying to get in to get copies of the literacy test, Sheriff Clark met me on the top of the steps. And he said, John Lewis, you're an outside agitator. You're the lowest form of humanity. I looked at the sheriff, and I said, Sheriff Clark, I may be an agitator, but I'm not an outsider. I grew up only 90 miles from here, and we're going to stay here to these people allowed to register to vote. And he said, you're under arrest. And he arrested about 60 of us, took us all to jail. A few days later, Martin Luther King Jr. and others came to Selma and marched on the courthouse. And more than 300 people were arrested. We filled the city jail, the city stockade, the county jail. And the American press told the story. And then, about two weeks later, in a little town called Marion, Alabama, Perry County, Alabama, is the home county of Mrs. Coretta Scott King, the home county of Mrs. Andrew Young, the late Jean Young, the home county of Mrs. Ralph Abernathy, Juanita Abernathy. There was a march that evening for the right to vote in this little county. A confrontation occurred. One young man by the name of Jimmy Lee Jackson tried to protect his mother. He was shot in the stomach by a state trooper. And a few days later, he died at the Good Samaritan Hospital in Selma. And because of what happened to him, we decided to march from Selma to Montgomery. So on Sunday, March 7, 1965, at the church, about 600 of us, mostly elderly black men and women and a few young people, participated in a nonviolent workshop. We had a prayer. Someone started singing. And then it became a silent walk. We were walking in tools through the streets of Selma, exercising our constitutional rights. No one said a word. I was wearing a backpack before it became fashionable to wear backpacks. <laughs> I thought we were going to be arrested and that we were going to go to jail. So in this backpack, I wanted to have something to read. I had two books. One was by a professor from Harvard, political scientist. The other one by Thomas Merton. I wanted to have something to eat. I had an apple and I had an orange that wouldn't last too long. 
And since I was going to be in jail with my friends, my colleagues, and neighbors, I wanted to be able to brush my teeth. I had toothpaste and toothbrush. <laughs> we get to the edge of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, crossing the Alabama River. Young man walking beside me, named Jose Williams, said, John, can you swim? He saw all of this water down in the Alabama River. I said, no. I said, Jose, can you swim? He said, yes. I said, well, there's too much water there. We're not going to jump. We're going straight ahead. And we continued to walk. And we came to the highest point on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. We saw a sea of blue down below. Alabama State Troopers. And we continued to walk. We came within hearing distance of the state troopers. A man identified himself and said, I'm Major John Clyde of the Alabama State Troopers. This is an unlawful march. It will not be allowed to continue. I give you three minutes to disperse and return to your church. In less than a minute and a half, the major said, troopers advance. You saw these men putting on their gas masks. They came toward us, beating us with nightsticks and bull whips tramping us with horses, releasing the tear gas, was hit in the head by a state trooper with a nightstick, had a concussion at the bridge. I thought I saw death. I thought I was going to die. That Sunday became known as Bloody Sunday. 17 of us were hospitalized. There was a sense of righteous indignation during the next few days when the American people witnessed by way of television, by way of newspapers and magazines, what had happened. There were demonstrations in more than 80 American cities at American embassies around the world when people saw what had happened in Selma. Because of Bloody Sunday in Selma, Alabama, President Lyndon Johnson invited Governor Wallace to come to Washington to meet with him to try to get his assurance that he would be able to protect us. He could not assure the president. So Lyndon Johnson on March 15th, 1965, eight days after Bloody Sunday, made one of the most meaningful speeches that any American president had made in modern time on the whole question of voting rights and civil rights. Lyndon Johnson spoke to a joint session of the Congress, spoke to the American people. He started that speech off that night by saying, I speak tonight for the destiny of America. He went on to say, at time, history and fate meet in a single place in an unending search for freedom. So it was more than a century ago at Lexington and at Concord. So it was at Appomattox. So it was last week in Selma, Alabama. And before Lyndon Johnson concluded that speech, as he introduced the voting rank site, he said, and we shall overcome. I was sitting next to Martin Luther King Jr. in the home of a local family in Selma. I looked at Dr. King and tears came down his eyes. He started crying, and we all cried a little. And he said to me, John, we will make it from Selma to Montgomery, and the voting rank site would be passed. But it wouldn't have been able, we wouldn't have been successful if it hadn't been for the press, it was very dangerous to have a camera, to have a pencil and a pad in Selma, Alabama in 1965. To be covering the Freedom Rides in 1961. To be in Mississippi at Ole Miss in 1962. Journalists were beaten. One photographer was shot and killed. And tonight I salute these three unbelievable families. I salute all members of the media for the contribution you have made to bring us to this point. I know you're supposed to be free and, and not show your hands, but you're human beings. I think the media played a major role in helping to bring about this nonviolent revolution. 
It's a revolution of values. It's a revolution of ideas. I don't care what you say. We are a better country, and we are a better people. Just think, those same hands that pick cotton, that pull the corn, that gather the peanuts, in the heart of the American South with other hands, help elect Barack Obama as President of the United States. If someone, if someone had told me, if someone had told me when we were meeting with Lyndon Johnson at the signing of the Voting Rights Act on August 6, 1965, if someone had told me when I saw that copy of Life magazine, when I saw those TV footage telling the story of what happened and how it happened, and that we will live to see the day when we will come to that point as a nation and as a people and we take a significant step, a major step down a long road toward laying down the burden of race. I used to tell young people, students, elementary school students, high school, college students, I so said, if you don't believe in that we have changed, come and walk in my shoes. But now they can see it. I don't have to tell anybody. Since the election of Barack Obama as president of the United States of America, something has happened to our very psyche. I was sending you Tucker. I was on the streets of Atlanta a few days ago, and a young white gentleman who grew up in rural Alabama like I did, came up and hugged me and said, Congressman, we are free at last. The Civil War is over. <laughs> it is over. It is gone. <laughs> we should embrace it. We should celebrate. I told some of my colleagues in the Congress on yesterday. There's all these people coming to Washington. What are we going to do? So let it happen. <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> let it be. So, oh, maybe going to be two million, three million. And now today they're saying well, maybe four million people. But it's okay. It is all right. Barack Obama has created a movement, a movement for change that give us all a sense of hope People look different. They're speaking differently. I tell young people, as Dr. King was saying, straighten up your back. He said, when you straighten up your back, no man can ride you. We have witnessed, yes, we have witnessed a nonviolent revolution. Yes, we're in the process of building the beloved community. When I was growing up outside of Troy, Alabama, on that farm 50 miles from Montgomery, I had an aunt by the name of Sineva. And my aunt Sineva lived in what we call a shotgun house. I know here at the John F. Kennedy School, here in this city of learning, you've never seen a shotgun house. You don't even know what I'm talking about. But I know what I'm talking about because I was born in a shotgun house. For those of you who may not know what a shotgun house is, it's an old house, one way in, one way out. In the nonviolent sense, it's a house where you can bounce a basketball through the front door and we'll go straight out the back door. In the military sense of the old house where you can find a shotgun through the front door and the bullets will go straight out the back door. My aunt Sineva lived in a shotgun house. Sometimes she would walk out into the woods and take branches from a darkwood tree and tie these branches together and make a broom. And she called that broom the breast broom. And from time to time she would walk out 
and sweep this dirt yard very clean, sometimes two and three times a week, but especially on a Friday or Saturday, because she wanted the dirt yard to look very good during the weekend. One Saturday afternoon, a group of my brothers and sisters and a few of my first cousins, about 12 or 15 of us young children, while playing in my unseen evil dirt yard, an unbelievable storm came up. The wind started blowing, the thunder started rolling, the lightning started flashing, and the rain started beating on the tin roof of those shotgun houses. Month became terrified, started crying. She thought this whole house was going to blow away. So she got all of us little children together and told us to hold hands, and we did as we were told. The wind continued to blow. The thunder continued to roll. The lightning continued to flash. And the rain continued to beat on the tin roof of this old shotgun house. And we cried and we cried. We thought the house was going to blow away. And when one corner of this old house appeared to be lifting, she had us to walk to that corner to try to hold the house down with our little bodies. <laughs> when the other corner appeared to be lifting, had us to walk to that side to try to hold the house down with our little bodies. We were little children walking with the wind, but we never left the house. The struggle in America, whether for women's rights or civil rights, or for peace, for gay rights, for workers' rights, it's been part of an effort to hold the American house together. The Barack Obama campaign was saying, in effect, that we all live in the same house and we all must have a place at the table. That it doesn't matter whether we're black or white or Latino or Asian American or Native American. It doesn't matter whether we're gay or straight, Republican or Democrats or independent. We are one people, we are one family. We all live in the same house saying to us, just maybe our foremothers and our forefathers all came to this great land in different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. So I said to you tonight, continue, hang in there, keep the faith, walk with the wind, embrace the change that we all will enjoy not just for our generation, but for generation yet unborn. Thank you very much. Congressman Lewis has agreed to, uh, to address some questions, which is our tradition. Uh, I would ask that those of you who have a question for him to go to one of the four microphones that we have uh, around. Uh, I would ask that you identify yourself, and I would ask that you ask a question, not make a speech, even a short one. Uh, we would like to get the opportunity for those who want to ask questions uh, to uh, as many people as possible. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, uh, hello, my name is uh, Aaron Goldstein. I'm a uh, private citizen. Um, you're undoubtedly American, an American hero. Uh, I thank you very kindly. Um, and Senator McCain recently referred to you as one of the three wisest people in America. But as was mentioned earlier, uh, you stated that Senator McCain and Governor Palin 
we're sowing the seeds of hatred and division in this country. And with all due respect, that saddened Senator McCain and saddened myself. Senator McCain has never said segregation now, segregation tomorrow, or segregation forever. Governor Palin never stood in front of a schoolhouse door to block. We, we need a question, not Absolutely. a speech. Absolutely. Absolutely. Given what I've just said, my question to you is this. By likening the words of Senator McCain and Governor Palin to the incendiary hatred of segregation, haven't you, even unintentionally, diminished the meaning of racism? Well, um, my friend, uh, my brother, what I was simply trying to suggest a state that at some of the rallies, gatherings, of Senator McCain and Governor Palin. I heard words and language that I saw a witness during another period in our history. At some of those rallies that I saw by way of television and read about in, in newspapers, I heard things like, off him, terrorists, Kill him? Those are toxic words. I never suggested that either Mr. McCain or Senator McCain or Governor Palin was a segregation or racist. And I stand by my statement. Are there others of you with are there others of you with questions for for the congressman? Yes. Hi, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, my name is Lul Goshu. I'm an MPP two. Um, my question is pretty directly to the um, what words of hope do you have to offer to the Kennedy School students? Well, you know, I think the election of Barack Obama uh, more than anything uh, for the future. For, for the, the future, future. that what? stay here and study hard and learn as much as you can, <laughs> and, and and get out and, and see the world, and and believe believe that we can do better, yeah. as a nation and as a people and as part of the community of nation, and that that we cannot stand on the sideline, we all must be in the arena, we must be doing something, and people should study. It'll be, it'll be a, a wonderful thing if uh, someone, somewhere, he had the Kennedy School, and I know somebody's working on it right now, just analyze what happened. This was a brilliant campaign. I have never, ever seen anything like this. Never. It was a movement. I, the other day, in, in my own district in Atlanta, I was standing in the poll. I waited till November 4th to vote. I didn't do early voting, I didn't do advanced voting. I wanted to be there on, I wanted to stand in line on the day. I just wanted to be there. I wanted to have the feeling. And I stood in line, I didn't get in front of anyone. I stood in line for about an hour and a half. But several weeks ago, I stopped at a filling station near the Atlanta airport to uh, fill up my car with gas. And uh, you know the prices are coming down now so you can fill it up. Uh, <laughs> And there was a young man in front of me, and he said, uh, he said, I never registered. I don't believe in voting. He's about 32 years old. And I kept talking with this young man. And I said, sir, you must register. You must vote. This is the time. I said, people suffered. Some people died. Some people went to their grave never having an opportunity to register to vote. You have to. And the day I went to the poll, the precinct is at a high school. In front of me was this young man who got registered and was voting. And Cynthia, uh, your paper had a picture of him in, in the paper standing in front of me. And he, he, he voted. You have to get people to believe that change is possible. And Barack Obama convinced the American people that change is possible. Yes, we can. And people only believe. You have to have hope. You have to have faith. But nothing else would do. You have to believe that it can be done. 
People told us that we wouldn't make it from Selma to Montgomery, that we wouldn't get a voting rights act passed, that we wouldn't get a civil rights act. But we didn't give up. And we must never, ever give up. There may be some disappointment, some interruption, some setbacks, but you keep pushing. You keep moving. And that's what people must do, not just for ourselves. The sad thing about this period that we live in, because our economy is in the tank, and we don't have many resources, it's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. But Barack Obama, paraphrasing the words of Dr. King, we have some difficult days ahead. But as a people and as a nation, we will get there. And I believe we will. Yes, sir. Hi, Congressman. Uh, uh, Jake Jones, a private citizen. I saw you on the flight. That's, a, that, that's I right. I think you're more than a private citizen. That's right, yeah. Uh, D David Nyan's son-in-law as well. Uh, but in addition, you know, obviously, I run a government affairs group in Washington. Um, just want to ask a follow-up question. Uh, there's lots of euphoria about um, President-elect Obama. And given the conditions and just the expectations, is it possible or how can he live up to the expectations? How can he not disappoint? Well, I, we all must help the president. I'm convinced that this young man is going to be a good and great president. He has a vision, and I think he will lead the American people and lead the community and nation on a great journey. And we should be prepared to go with him on this journey. It's not just anything bad about the president administration, but we haven't been called upon to do anything during the past eight years. The only people that have been sacrificing are young men and young women in uniform. The rest of us have just been sort of, oh, well. Uh, but I think Barack Obama is going to challenge the best in all of us to go out and do something, not only here at home, but also abroad, and that we would answer the call. I'm very hopeful and very optimistic that we won't be disappointed. Yes, sir. Um. Hello, uh, my name is Robert Ruffins. Um, uh, I'm from Washington, D.C., and I grew up within sight of the Capitol. Um, and when I saw um, uh, Barack Obama get elected and what happened <laughs> in the yard, and I called my grandfather, who's 89, um, and told him what happened, you know, I could hear that he was crying. Though the one thing he told, posed to me as a question is, you know, will what do we do when we, you know, when you go back to your dorm room? You know, when I come back to D.C., you know, I grew up, you know, in a middle-class neighborhood, but I'm the only, me and my sister are the only people of the many children who, who grew up with me who are going to college. You know, when we go back and, the, you know, the excitement and the euphoria has worn off, you know, what then? Yeah, and I'm not sure if this is a question that can be answered, you know, in, you know, a uh, few words or a few minutes or even a few years, but you know, where do we go from here? Well, I think each one of us must take it up on ourselves to pass it on. That, that we've been blessed. We're more than lucky, but we are blessed to have an opportunity to, to get an education, to learn as much as possible. We have to reach back and bring others along. We all should find a way to make things better for all of the citizens that dwell on, on this little piece of real estate that we call America. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Sridhar Prasad. I'm a, a JD MBA student here. Uh, Congressman, thank you for your humanity, most of all. Um, there seems to be, I think, a, a sense that both not only in political life, but in civic life, in our business life, our business environments, a, a genuine lack of courage and leadership in, in this day and age. Um, one need only look at the recent hearings of yesterday and the recent hearings of a couple of months ago to note the lack of courage and leadership that exists perhaps in public life. Um, as someone with 
a healthy amount of both. Um, why do you see that as being such in this day and age, and what, what are maybe some of the causes behind it, and how do we move beyond that to have sort of leaders that the kinds that we read about in history books sort of come alive once again? Well, we have to convince and, and tell people just uh, what I call having an executive session. I told some of my colleagues today, we had a little election of uh, committee chairs today, and I was supporting a particular person. That's why my voice sounds so I preached today to the Democratic caucus. And I don't know how many people I converted, but I, I did. <laughs> but I said, before we cast our vote, each of us should have an executive session with ourselves. And I said, some place I read, some place I heard, that we should do unto others as we would have them to do unto us. Too many of us in, in government, in, in business, and in private, we, we, we operate by poles. We don't go with our guts, with our soul, with our heart. We tend to put our fingers in the air to see which way the wind is blowing. But if you believe in something, you have to go for it. When, when I was growing up and we visit the little town of Troy or visit Montgomery or Tuskegee, and I saw those signs and I would ask my mother and my father, my grandparents and my great grandparents, and they would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way. Don't get in trouble. But one day I heard Martin Luther King Jr. on the old radio when I was 15 years old. And he inspired me to get in the way, to get in trouble. And I've been getting in trouble ever since. <laughs> so. My name is um, Ian Merrifield, and I'm a freshman here at the college. And Congressman Lewis, thank you so much for, for being here tonight. And um, your words were deeply inspiring, and I won't ever forget them. Um, I believe it was Newton who once said, if I've seen farther than others, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants. On whose shoulders uh, is Barack Obama standing? And more importantly, sir, do your shoulders hurt? <laughs> uh, no, no. Uh, I think Barack Obama is standing on the shoulders of many, many countless, nameless individuals. And it would take me too long to call the roll. And when I think about it sometime, I, I've cried a great deal during the past few days. And um, sometime, a uh, young reporter interviewed me a few days ago. I cried and the reporter cried also. We all, sh we had to stop the camera, just stop. Because it's, it's amazing, it's unreal, it's unbelievable. Leading up to the campaign, to the election itself, for several days, I couldn't sleep. I just, I, was, I would get up in, in the morning, and uh, whether in Washington or in Atlanta, to try to get the news like 3 o'clock in the morning. Who's that ABC with uh, the morning uh, starting around 3 o'clock? <laughs> and, and you get up, and you watch a little news, or you get uh, CBS up to the minute, NBC, today's, whatever they call it. And, you get the early edition of newspapers and you go online. You just want to know what's happening, what's going on. Um, I love current events. From a, from a young child, when I was growing up very, very young, my family was too poor to have a subscription to the Montgomery Advertiser. So my grandfather had one. And every day when he would finish reading his newspaper, we would get his newspaper and we would read it. And I think it made me a better person and informed me of what was happening in Alabama, in America, and around the world. And then came television. I don't want to say anything, but in Barack Obama's book, Audacity of Hope, he said he had three heroes. Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King Jr., and John Lewis. I am uh, flattered that he would say something like that. I don't consider myself a hero. 
But there were people like Fannie Lou Hamer, this brave and courageous black woman in the Delta, Mississippi. Countless individuals that never, never, ever lived to register to vote, but they tried to get registered. They tried to vote, and many of them went to their death. And I would like to think they must be looking down from someplace, rejoicing with this unbelievable victory. So I think you stand on the shoulder of generations of warriors, generation of fighters. People, many individuals went to create the climate and the environment that made it happen. One more question. Yes, sir. Congressman Lewis, thank you very much for coming. My name is Earl Benson. I'm a student at the law school and the business school. And uh, in your book in 1998, in the end of it, you talk about the fact that there needs to be a new movement, an economic movement. And obviously, those words are prescient given uh, the current state of the economy. What do we need to do now, and what steps do we take um, to create this movement now, a new economic development movement? Well, I, I, I really believe that the Barack Obama's campaign is the essence of that movement. Uh, I'm not saying that I was predicting anything or that I saw something coming along, but I tell you, uh, to see hundreds and thousands of people, people leaving Georgia, going to Florida. So, oh, we can't win in Georgia, let's go and help in Florida as a possibility. You know, people leaving Virginia, going to North Carolina, people leaving North Carolina, going to Virginia. Uh, 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 people leaving Washington, D.C., uh, going to Pennsylvania. And, and people traveling all over the country. People giving up a semester. People taking their vacation time. That's what you call a movement. I think the important thing is for the American people and all of the supporters of Barack Obama to stay engaged. I think he's going to put together a great cabinet, going to bring in the best and the brightest, and hopeful. We get some resources. Maybe you will see something akin maybe to the New Deal or the Great Society that we would get health care for all of our people. I happen to believe, and I think Barack Obama believed, that health care is a right. Senator Kennedy strongly believed that, that it is a right, and it's not a privilege, and all of our people should have health care. We've got to do that. Almost 50 million of our citizens without any health insurance, health care. We've got to have comprehensive, universal health care. That is one thing that we must do. And, and I believe under the leadership of Barack Obama and with our growing majority in the House and the Senate, we're going to do it. We will, uh, we will continue this conversation tomorrow at the top of the Taubman building, which is right across the, the uh, yard. Uh, Lawrence Bobo, the W.B. Du Bois Professor of Social Sciences at Harvard will be there. Alex Castellanos of the Institute of Politics, and a specialist in uh, media communication for five presidential campaigns. Marilee Schwartz, visiting, Lomba, or visited, uh, visiting moral lecturer at the practice of pal uh, <laughs> visiting moral lecturer. She works for me, I ought to know what her title is. <laughs> anyway. She's terrific, was at the Washington Post, she's at the Shorenstein Center, and she'll be part of this conversation too. She's a specialist in politics. And Cynthia Tucker, uh, editorial page editor of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist herself. And I'm very glad to say, John Lewis will be with us as well. So we hope we will see you tomorrow at nine o'clock. Bob Herbert, congratulations. John Lewis, thank you.